Carbon Economics provides services to customers in these six main areas. Carbon Consulting, which is all about setting policy and understanding your footprint. Optimization and Recovery, which is all about energy efficiency as a key road to reducing carbon emissions. Renewable Energy, we're one of the largest renewable energy engineering firms in the world. Carbon Capture and Sequestration, I don't know if many of you have heard of that. This is about capturing carbon emissions from coal-fired power stations, etc., and actually sequestering it in the deep geological subsurface. And then working with coal and gas industry to help them reduce their emissions quite significantly. At the core of any firm, private sector, or even government's issue around carbon, you can have a graph like this. On the vertical axis, I've got tons of CO2 <coughs> equivalent per annum. That might be your annual emissions. And on the right, on the bottom here, sorry, on the x-axis, we have time. And the key issue here is that if I'm an organization that's growing or hoping to expand, as we are, then our carbon emissions might be expected over time to rise. So this is what I say BAU, business as usual carbon footprint. So if we keep doing our business in the same way that we have done it historically, we would expect that, for most of us anyway, most of our organizations worldwide, that our carbon emissions are going to rise over time. Now, at that stage, a firm or an organization might say, I want to do something about that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a big bite out of that carbon emission, and I'm going to move down to the red line. This is my future goal, my future aspiration. Now, this is all very well and good, but one question that I would ask you, if you were, if I was working with you and you showed me this graph, is I would say, how do you choose the red line? Because you could just as easily go, that's my objective, or something in between, or you could go straight down to zero very quickly, and so on. There's a number of different objectives you could choose. Many of, organ of the organizations that I'm working with worldwide are saying things like, we want to be carbon neutral by 2030. So presumably that's a straight line from now until 2030. So where are you drawing your red line? It makes a big difference, as we'll see, depending on, it's going to make a big difference to your cost and also to the benefit that you actually produce to society on how you choose that line. And the second is, if that's my goal, how do I get there? Many of you are familiar with the Sokolow's wedge concept. Sokolow from MIT developed this um, some years ago. The idea that to reach a carbon reduction objective, there's going to be probably a number that it's not only about carbon. Carbon is intimately connected to so many other things that we do in our businesses. I call this the sustainability triad, but carbon, energy, and water, for instance, are inextricably linked. If you try to manage your water better for improved sustainability in your water area, treat your water to a higher standard, move water around so that you don't waste it, move it from one use to another, you need energy to move the water. If your energy is carbon-based, you're going to use more carbon to get a better water result, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that we see again and again and again is that if you focus only on carbon in managing your carbon footprint, you'll usually get the wrong answer. You will be suboptimal. How many tons of carbon is worth one cubic meter of water? If I have a water problem and a carbon problem, which one do I spend more on and why? How many, how many, um, and, and, and not to be uh, too mercenary about this, but how many incidents of health effects or breathing disruption, asthmatic conditions from airborne dust, how many cases of, of that particular impact on people is worth how many tons of carbon? How do you make those, those comparisons? Most people in the sustainability business for the last 20 years, and I've been in it, the business as usual, is we do it qualitatively. We, we draw 
we, we rank them with traffic lights or smiley faces, you know, smiley face for good and then a neutral face for medium and a sad face for bad and we kind of rank the options that way. That's what happens. Multi-criteria analysis basically, right? Qualitative, expert based. Doesn't give you the right answer is what I've found over 15 years. And what I would suggest we think about here, because we're business people, is that a way to do this is to deploy the fast growing science of ecological and environmental economics to actually value all of these environmental and social aspects, including carbon. But all these things can be valued in terms of dollars. Not cost, but the value. So for instance, the value of a rainforest is not just the fact that it purifies water and purifies air and produces oxygen, fixes carbon, but it fixes soil. It's a nursery for a wide variety of species. There's huge biodiversity there. These things all matter to us. And environmental and ecological economists have spent the last 20 years valuing those things and can give us some pretty robust ranges of dollar values for all kinds of environmental and social questions and issues. If we can do that, if we can do that and provide dollars here, all of a sudden we have a common unit and we can start making trade-offs. So I can tell you right now that one ton of carbon, social cost of carbon might be around $100 a ton, but the, the value right now, the social cost of a ton of uh, SO2, which creates acid rain, and can have very, very strong health impacts is around $1,500 a ton. So if you're looking at a project where you're wanting to remove SO2, SOx and NOx, and you might have to use more energy and create more CO2, there's a balance, and you can find it. 